Boy. Senor? In my chamber window lies a book. Bring it hither to me in the orchard. I am already here, sir. I know that. I would have thee hence and here again. I do much wonder that one man, seeing how much another man is a fool when he dedicates his behaviours to love, will, after he hath laughed at such shallow follies in others, become the argument of his own scorn by falling in love. And such a man is Claudio. I have known when there was no music with him but the drum and the fife. And now had he rather hear the top of the pipe. I have known when he would have walked ten mile afoot to see a good armour. And now he will lie ten nights awake carving the fashion of a new doublet. He was wont to speak plain and to the purpose, like an honest man and a soldier. And now he has turned to thography. His words are a very fantastical banquet. Just so many strange dishes. May I be so converted and see with these eyes. I cannot tell. I think not. I shall not be sworn. But love may transform me to an oyster. But I'll take my oath on it. Till he hath made an oyster of me. He shall never make me such a fool. One woman is fair, yet I am well. Another is wise, yet I am well. Another virtuous, yet I am well. But till all graces be in one woman, one woman shall not come in my grace. Rich she shall be, that's certain. Wise, or I'll none. Virtuous, or I'll never cheapen her. Fair, or I'll never look on her. Mild, or not me for an angel. Of good discourse, an excellent musician, and her hair shall be of what color it please God. <laughs> the prince of Monsieur Love, I will hide me in the arbor. Come, we shall hear this music. <coughs> yea, my good lord, how still the evening is, as hushed up purpose to grace harmony. See who at Benedict hath hurt himself. Very well, my lord. <coughs> the music ended and fits the kit box with a pennyworth. <laughs> Come, Balthazar, we'll hear that song again. Oh, good my lord, text not so bad a voice to slander music any more than once. Oh, it is the witness still of excellency to put a strange face on his own perfection. <laughs> I pray thee sing, and let me woo no more. Because you talk of wooing, I will sing, since many a wooer doth commence his suit to her he thinks not worthy. <laughs> yet he woos, yet will he swear he loves. <laughs> Nay, pray thee come, or if that will hold longer arguments, do it in notes. Note this before my notes. Not a note of mine that's worth noting. Why, these are the very crotchets he speaks. Notes! Notes. Forsooth or nothing. <clears throat> no divine heir. Now is his soul ravished. Is it not strange that sheep's guts should <laughs> heal souls out of man's bodies? <laughs> well, a horn for my money when all's done.
and sign not so, but let them go. Singer, my lord. I'm faith now that sings it well enough for a shift. And he been a dog that should have held us, they would have hanged him. Hey, Mary, <laughs> dost thou hear, Balthazar? Get us some excellent music for tomorrow night. We shall have it at the Lady Hero's chamber window. The best I can, my lord. Uh, do so. Oh. Farewell. <laughs> Come hither, Leonardo. <coughs> what was it you told me of the other day? That your niece, Beatrice, is in love with Signor Benedict? <laughs> hey, stalk on, stalk on. The vow sits. <coughs> oh, I did never think that lady would have loved any man. No, nor I neither. But most wonderful that she should so dote on Signor Benedict whom she hath in all outward behaviours seemed ever to abhor. Is it possible? Sits the wind in that corner? By my troth, my lord, I know not what to think of it, but that she loves him with an enraged affection. It is past the infinite of thought. Maybe she doth but counterfeit. Faith like enough. Oh, Lord, counterfeit. There was never counterfeit of passion came so near the life of passion as she discovers it. Why, what effects of passion shows she? Bait the hook well, this fish will bite. What effects, my lord? Uh, she will sit you, uh, uh, you've heard my daughter tell you how. She did indeed. Well, how, how, I pray you, you amaze me. I would have thought her spirit invincible against all assaults of affection. I would have thought so too, my lord, especially against Benedict. <laughs> I should think it's a goal, but that the grey-haired fellow speaks it. <laughs> <laughs> Never cannot sure hide himself in such reverence. He intended his affection. Hold it up. <coughs> Hath she made her affection known to Benedict? No, and swears she never will. That's her torment. Oh. Tis true indeed. So your daughter says, shall I, says she, that so often encounters him with scorn, writes to him that I love him? <laughs> this says she now when she is beginning to write to him. For she will be up 20 times a night. And there she will sit in her smock till she hath writ a sheet of paper. My daughter tells us all. <laughs> now you talk of a sheet of paper. I remember a pretty jest your daughter told us of. When she had writ it and was reading it over, she found Benedict and Beatrice between the sheet. <laughs> that. Oh. She tore the letter into a thousand half pence, railed at herself, that she should be so immodest to write to one that she knew would flout her. I measure him, says she, by my own spirit, for I should flout him if he writ to me, yea, though I love him, I should. Then, down upon her knees, she falls, weeps, sobs, beats her heart, tears her hair, prays, curses, oh, sweet Benedict, God give me patience. She doth indeed. My daughter says so. And the ecstasy hath so much overcome her that my daughter is afeard she will sometime do a desperate outrage to herself. Ah! It is very true. It were good Benedict knew of it by some other. 
If she will not discover it, to what end? He will but make a sport of it and torment the poor lady worse. And so will he do, for it were an arms to hang him. For she is an excellent sweet lady, and out of all suspicion, she is virtuous. Yeah, she's exceeding wise in everything but loving Benedict. <laughs> <laughs> I would. She had bestowed this dotage on me. I would have daft all other respects and made her half myself. I pray you tell Benedict and hear what he will say. Were it good, think you? Hero thinks surely she will die. But she says she will die if he loves her not, and she will die ere make her love known, and she will die if he woos her, rather than bait one breath of her accustomed crossness. <laughs> she doth well, for if she were to make tender of her love, tis possible he'll scorn it. For the man, as you know all, hath a contemptible spirit. He's a proper man. <laughs> he had a good outward happiness. From God, and in my mind, very wise. Oh, he doth indeed show some sparks that are like wit. I take him to be valiant. <laughs> oh, as Hector, I assure you. And in the managing of quarrels, you may say he is wise, for he either avoids them with great discretion or undertakes them with a most Christian-like fear. <laughs> If he do fear God, he must necessarily keep the peace. If he break the peace, he should enter into a quarrel with fear and trembling. Oh, and so will he do. For the man doth fear God, though it seems not in him by some large jests he will make. Well, I am sorry for your niece. Mm. Let us go seek Benedict and tell him of her love. Never tell him, my lord. Let her wear it out with good counsel. Nay, that's impossible. She may wear her heart out first. <laughs> well, we will hear further of it by your daughter. <clears throat> Let it cool the while. I love Benedict well, and I could modestly wish he would examine himself to see how unworthy he is of so good a lady. My lord, will you walk <laughs> dinner? He's ready. <laughs> you do not go to know upon this. I will never trust my expectation. Ha! Let the same net be spread for her. That must your daughter and her gentlewoman carry. The sport will be when they hold an opinion of one another's dotage and no such matter. That's the scene I would see, which will be merely a dumb show. <laughs> Let us send her to call him into dinner! <laughs> this can be no trick. <laughs> the conference was sadly born. They have the truth of this from Hero. They seem to pity the lady. It seems her affections have their full bent. Love me? <laughs> Why, it must be requited. I hear how I am censored. They say I will bear myself proudly if I perceive the love come from her. They say too that she will rather die than give any sign of affection. I did never think to marry. I must not seem proud. Happy are they that hear their detractions and can put them demanding. They say the lady is fair. Tis a truth. I can bear them witness. And virtuous. Tis so. I cannot reprove it. And wise. But for loving me. <laughs> by my troth. It is no addition to her wit nor no great argument of her folly, for I will be horribly in love with her. <laughs> <laughs> I may chance have some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me, because I have railed against marriage for so long. But doth not the appetite alter? A man loves a maid in his youth that he cannot endure in his age. Shall quips and sentences and these paper bullets of the brain awe a man from the career of his humour? 
No. The world must be peopled. <laughs> when I said I would die a bachelor, I did not think I should live till I were married. <laughs> Here comes Beatrice. <laughs> By this day, she's a fair lady. <laughs> I do spy some marks of love in her. <laughs> Against my will, I am said to bid you come into dinner. Fair Beatrice. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you for your pains. I took no more pains for those thanks than you take pains to thank me. Had it been painful, I would not have come. You take pleasure then in the message? Yes, senor. Just so much as you may take upon a knife's point and choke a door withal. You have no stomach, senor. Pray well. Ah, against my will, I'm sent to bid you come in to dinner. There's a double meaning in that. <laughs> I took no more pains for those thanks than you took pains to thank me. That's as much to say, any pains I take for you is as easy as thanks. I am a villain if I do not love her.